evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us, Paige and myself. My name is Danny Bedor. I'm the CEO of Simply Do It. I'm based in California, Southern California. I've been uh, working with real estate investors primarily on buying um, rental properties throughout the country for the past almost 20 years. I've kind of guided through the process of uh, buying somewhere along the 5,000 rental properties and maybe close to 100 flips uh, in my career. So I've been through boom and bust and uh, successes and, uh, uh, and failures and, and everything in between. Um, I'm not here to talk about myself because this is an event uh, Paige and I uh, uh, kind of decided to put together primarily to focus on notes. And I would say probably uh, my guess, non-performing primarily, but maybe she'll expand the, the way uh, she usually does. So if you're not familiar with Paige, she's the, the other person in red, uh, which, which we did not coordinate colors. We should have uh, next time we make sure we do. <clears throat> and uh, Paige, is, uh, Paige and I know each other for many years. Uh, we've uh, shared stages and we've shared uh, uh, speaking uh, you know, um, uh, um, venues. She is, um, she sent me the bio, but I can tell you that when I heard her speak, um, I could relate to almost everything she said because she has extensive experience in real estate. I think she, or not think, she kind of came into the notes world from necessity or pain or, or all of the above after being through residential and commercial real estate and through booms and busts and you know flips and successes. And I know failures too, same here. We, we, we can relate on that. Uh, so I'm not gonna steal off the thunder <laughs> of the knowledge of the information. I'm sure she will give a better uh, ex um, information about herself uh, and her experience. Um, she is very knowledgeable for many years on notes uh, and non-performing notes, uh, an exciting topic, uh, but more important than exciting, um, doable and very interesting or very good investment avenue for, in my opinion, for real estate investors. So uh, without uh, further ado, Paige, I'm gonna toss over the, this mic to you as if I can through here. Thank you, and I'll let you take the lead. And I'm gonna be quieting myself down and kind of see what hell, what I can do to help. Oh, I appreciate it, and and thank you, Danny, so much. Um, again, happy. I'm happy to be here. Uh, as all of you can tell, I'm known as the cash flow chick. Uh, no, I don't. That's not my real name. My real name is Paige Panzarello, of course. <laughs> but yes, I'm AKA the cash flow chick. Um, and as Danny said, I've been in real estate and real estate investing for a really long time, uh, 25 years, actually a little over 25 years. Um, and I am, I'm so excited uh, to talk to you tonight about notes. Those of you that have seen me speak, if you see some overlap, I'm sorry about that. Those of you um, that have heard my story, you're going to hear it again. Sorry about that. Uh, but I do like to kind of give the background of, of why I got to where I am and how I got to where I am. So uh, without further ado, let me, let me kind of share my story a little bit. Uh, I started in real estate and real estate investing at a very young age, and, and I did not choose real estate, everybody. Real estate kind of chose me. Uh, I was, like I said, in my, in my mid young mid-20s, so I'm kind of dating myself there. Um, and I had a, a family member, a grandmother, who owned large estate, uh, some in California, some property in California, and some in Arizona. And she passed away. Uh, and we had this very large estate, my family and I had this very large estate to kind of sift through um, that was severely in debt. It was about $4 million in debt. And so my family decided to, you know, handle, handle all of the California assets, but I went off um, at my ripe old age of 20 something uh, into Arizona. And the interesting thing about it is that, again, I had no background. I had no knowledge, no experience at all about real estate or real estate investing. And as such, I had to surround myself with people that had the answers to the questions that I had to ask. 
back in those days, everybody, there, there wasn't groups like this. There, there certainly wasn't Zoom, um, you know, but there were not RIA groups. There weren't meetup groups. There, weren't, there, were no, there was no structure or support um, that you have today. So we really had to, you know, if you wanted to get into this business, you really had to surround yourself with people and ask lots of questions. Um, so let me, let me do this. I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Hopefully everybody can see it. So that way you have a little bit of my contact information as well when we get there. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, I, I went off to Arizona not knowing anything and I found myself um, realizing that I kind of liked this real estate stuff. Now, at the time we had 38 townhome units, some land and a sewer treatment plant, okay? Um, the 38 townhome units, we were only about 40% occupied. And of the, the remaining 60% uh, that were unoccupied, half of those, if not more, were broken, meaning they were not habitable. So I had to start doing fixing and flipping before I even knew what fixing and flipping was, right? Because we needed to get the occupancy up. Um, I was very fortunate that, again, I surrounded myself with people that, at, that had the answers to the questions I was asking. And I did what I said I was going to do. Um, I owed my grandmother's estate owed a lot of people. Um, and so I said, this is my plan. I went to each of those people. I had a meeting with them and I said, this is my plan. This is what I want to do. And I was very fortunate that they worked with me to get me to a place where I could start generating a lot more money to be able to pay them. Um, and I did. So within 18 months, uh, I had all of the units uh, 100% occupied. And we were, we were doing very well. Um, so we were cash flowing at that, on that property. The sewer treatment plant was up and running. Um, and then there was this land sitting on the side. And I realized very quickly that we were not gonna be able to sustain uh, the profitability of the townhome units because we were in a boutique market and the, the raising the rents all the time was not going to be conducive uh, to the, the clientele or to our renters that could stay there, um, that could afford to live there. So I, I went to my family and I said, I think we should sell off all these units individually and then take that money and build on the land. And my family wanted nothing to do with that. So I decided, okay, I'm going to buy the company. So I did. Uh, I leveraged the remaining assets uh, and I borrowed money against that. And we ended up selling the sewer treatment plant uh, to the district. And then as we were selling each condo, each townhome unit, uh, I used that money toward, you know, we made some money, of course, but I paid off debt and then used that money toward building on the land. Now, I knew nothing about construction at all. But I met with a, a contractor and an architect, and we designed this large townhome project. Uh, and I, as, as soon as we started coming out of the ground, or actually, as soon as we started digging the infrastructure to come out of the ground, I realized that the contractor was going to bankrupt me. Uh, he was going through money right and left with change orders, and, and I was so new, I had no idea, right? So I fired him. And I decided, okay, I can do this. And I started my own construction company. Now I knew nothing at all about construction. So I found a qualifying party, uh, which is just a gentleman who had been in the business long enough. Uh, and he came on as a shareholder in my corporation and my corporation held all of our con um, construction licenses except HVAC and roofing. And the reason that we didn't have those is the liability insurance was entirely too high. Uh, so. Now again, this is pre nineteen or pre pre two thousand and five, right? This is early early two thousand. So we started building. We started building my projects. We started growing our our employees. Uh, we ended up with thirty six employees in three years. Uh, we were building our own projects, everybody else's projects. I was making money hand over fist, and I can tell you that I it was putting me in an early grave. Um, I I was working seven days a week, eighteen hours a day. I couldn't go home. My family was all in California, um, and but I was in Arizona because I had to manage all these properties and, and all these projects and my construction company. Now, I was very fortunate because even though I was young and fairly naive, um, I took the money that I was making and I started investing it in other cash flowing assets, right? So I bought up a bunch of other assets, which was great. 
I had liquidity, I had large equipment, I had cash flowing assets, I had other assets and other projects I was going to build on. And again, I was putting myself in an early grave because the stress of all of that was just tremendous. And I really started thinking, how am I going to continue to endure all of this? Uh, And then life happened and then the crash happened. And interestingly enough, I saw it coming because I knew who I was selling second and, th- second and third homes to. And I saw that it was not going to be sustainable. Uh, I saw the loans that were being you know, put in place by mortgage lenders. And I thought, this is not going to be able to continue. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Now, my naivete was that I did not realize that the crash was going to happen to me personally. Um, largely because I was only encumbered about 10%. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a lot of debt and I didn't owe a tremendous amount of money, but I did owe um, quite a bit of money to other people and other people owed way more money to me. Now, when you're in construction, you carry that bill um, for at least 90 days, usually more like 120 days. So you put the bill and then you bill uh, the, the person with whom you're working to do their project, and then they'll pay you back, right? And I was running at the time. Now, keep in mind, this is really early 2000s. So, you know, 2005, 2006, I was running, I was running payroll at $25,000 a week. So, you know, multiply that with many, many crews, multiply that with many, many projects, and all those people owing me money, and then the crash happened, and their lending froze up. So they couldn't pay me. Now, I had a choice to make. I thought to myself, I can do like a lot of people did and file for bankruptcy. That certainly would have been within my right to do, um, and it would have been understandable. I chose not to do that, however. I decided instead to sell off all of my assets, all of them, uh, and literally cash was king at that point. So, you know, literally it was pennies on the dollar. And I worked very hard um, to sell all of the, get as much as I possibly could and pay off everybody that I owed money to, even though I wasn't getting paid. And at the end of the day, it took me three years um, to, to get everybody paid in full, to get all of the assets you know, sold off so I could pay everybody in full. And I walked away out of Arizona, back to California, having lost $20 million. Now, I often, you'll hear me say that that was a blessing to me, and it was also a very difficult learning experience. And I don't mean to be cavalier about losing $20 million, but it taught me something, everybody. I mean, that it, 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 was, it was hard, don't get me wrong. It was very, very difficult to lose that amount of money, but it brought me home to my family. It taught me who I am as an investor. It taught me how I deal with people and how I relate to people. It taught me how I, Uh, handle money and and how I manage money. It taught me uh, about understanding my risk tolerance because back then I was was bold. I could afford, you know, I could take risks. Now I'm very risk averse. So that's why it is a blessing for me. And I came back into real estate. I went away for a little while, but I came back into real estate investing because it's a passion of mine and I'm good at it. And it just pulled at my heart. I wasn't happy doing the other small little entrepreneurial things that I was doing. So I came back in, but I came back in better and stronger. Um, I'm more successful now. Uh, and I am, and I wouldn't be sitting right here right now if all of that stuff did not happen to me. So it really did shape me and who I am as an investor. And so that's why I consider it a blessing because I did learn from it. And a lot of people are fearful of failure. And I'm going to strongly urge you to not be fearful of failure. You will have an oops in real estate and real estate investing. It happens. It happens to all of us. And if somebody has told you that they have never lost money in a real estate deal, I'm going to urge you to run in the other direction. Because one of two things is happening. Either they're lying to you or they haven't been around long enough uh, to have had loss, you know, the, the experience of losing money. But it happens to all of us. The cool thing is, is that when you get into the note space, if you've educated yourself enough, there's a lot that we can do to mitigate against that loss 
uh, and it mitigates our risk. So when I got here into the note space and I started studying when I first came back into real estate and I had to build up my capital, everybody, because it was gone. So I had to start all over again. And then the whole time I was educating myself about notes. And when I made some money, I put it toward a note. And I, I had to prove the concept to myself before I brought other people along uh, for this amazing ride. So let's talk a little bit about notes. And let's see if I've got my clicker. Yes, okay, there we go. So what are notes? Uh, notes, everybody, is just a debt instrument. It basically is a promise to pay, okay? And quite literally, you become the bank for somebody. So if any of you have ever bought a house, the house that you're living in, and you, about 30 days later, let's say you put a mortgage in place, and 30 days later, you get a letter that says, oh, by the way, your new servicer is this company. This is where you're going to send your payments. Or, oh, your new lender is this company. That's what's happened. Your note has been sold. Okay. And so when you invest in notes, you literally step into the shoes of the bank. So just call me Mrs. Chase. Okay. Um, there are different kinds of notes that you can buy and if different kinds of notes that you can invest in. There are performing assets, performing notes. There's non-performing notes. There's secured notes. There are unsecured notes. There's first position, second position, HELOCs. HELOCs are called are the home equity line of credit. Uh, the first position is, is the first mortgage, so it's the first to get paid. Second position liens are behind the first mortgage. Secured notes are, are notes like I invest in. Uh, you can invest in notes that where you buy car loans. And the security is the car. If the, if the borrower does not pay that loan back on the monthly payments as they should, you can go and repossess that car as the bank. Same thing with houses. So I, I uh, invest in first position non-performing notes. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But first position non-performing notes secured by real estate. Okay. Now, Again, there's performing notes, which is just like what it, what it sounds like. The borrower makes their mortgage payment every single month consistently. So that's a great avenue for cash flow if that's what you're looking for. Non-performing notes is just like what it sounds like. They have, the borrower has stopped paying their mortgage payment because life has happened to them. And sometimes these borrowers have stopped paying their mortgage for years, literally years and years and years, and they're literally just squatting in their home. And we're going to talk about them in just a minute. Uh, but I buy those non-performing notes. And people think, well, oh, gosh, that, that's, that's absolutely crazy. You know, why on earth would you buy a non-performing note? And the reason that I buy non-performing notes is I get a much bigger discount on the purchase price of that note, okay? And I buy notes based on the current market value of the securing collateral, which means the house, and then I get a big discount from there. We're gonna talk about numbers in just a minute, but I discount it immediately just on the current market value. So as the house sits right now, and then I get a big discount uh, from, from that, and that builds in a cushion of equity, everybody. And when you have equity and a cushion of equity like that, it mitigates your risk, okay? So crazy like a fox. It sounds crazy, but crazy like a fox uh, because it, it really mitigates risk for me. All right. Is there competition in note investing? I'm often asked this question. Mm -hmm. And yes, like anything else, there is competition in note investing. But I like to call it the gentler form of investing and real estate investing. And the reason for that is that, especially now, if any of you are doing fixing and flipping, especially right now, you will probably have seen and have competed for houses that are broken where they're going for tens of thousands, if not $100,000 over asking uh, because people are looking for those deals. That does not happen in the note space. In the note space, it's very collaborative uh, and there's, there is competition, but it's much gentler. What will happen is a tape, that's, that's basically an Excel spreadsheet that, 
that lists all the assets for sale from a bank or a hedge fund, um, that tape will, will list all those assets and I make indicative offers. I make bids to buy those assets. Now the asset manager is either gonna come back and say yes or no, or they're gonna counter my offer. And that's it. There's no, you know, it's, it's very gentle. Uh, it's very collaborative. And what I mean by that is that oftentimes as you grow as an investor, asset managers, meaning the people that are selling these notes, um, will often introduce you to other uh, sellers. And so it's very collaborative. You, you really kind of grow your network and your database of sellers that are going to just send you uh, tapes of assets for sale and, and there's very little effort. It literally ends up in my inbox when the seller has something to sell, okay? And we'll get there in a minute. So the next question, of course, is how do I find deals? There's two things that everybody looks for, right? Money and deals, deals and money, money and deals. So how do I find deals? I spend zero dollars, zero dollars on marketing. None. I do not do yellow letters. I don't send to list. I don't, I don't do door knocking. I don't drive for dollars. I spend the bulk of my day uh, sitting at my desk or, or anywhere I want to be uh, as comfortable and casual as I want to be. And my deals literally come to my inbox. Okay. Um, and how do I do that? I spend my money going traveling when we can, right? to conferences and I build relationships. That's all I do. I, I go to a variety of different real estate conferences. I go to a variety of different note investing conferences. Uh, there are plenty of them out there. There are subgroups, so RIA meetings, uh, real estate investor association meetings or real estate club meetings. I will go in and uh, frequent those. Um, and that's where I spend my time and my money in terms of marketing for deals. I just build relationships, everybody, and the deals come directly to my inbox, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, and I'm gonna take a sip of water first before I do that. Let's talk about some market trends because in this space, I want you to know that in this space, life happens to everybody, okay? So there's not ever going to be a shortage, in my opinion, there's not going to be a shortage of deal flow in note, the note space, okay? Um, because life happens. And we're gonna talk about that in a moment. However, we are in a very unique position right now. And the reason for that is because of COVID. And COVID caused uh, has caused a world <laughs> of problems. And I'm going to show you some numbers here because I track these. Now I pay for a service uh, to, to be able to track these numbers. Uh, and so these are real time. The first number you're going to see though is pre-COVID though. Okay. So in November of 2019, pre-COVID, uh, and this is just for my asset class. Okay. Single family residences, one to four, First position liens, so first position, uh, non-performing. So the, this is not commercial, multifamily, agricultural, none of that. No, no industrial, just single family residences, first position. So not second position, not HELOCs, nothing. First position, single family, uh, and, and just, just that little, that little uh, bubble, okay? Now, Anything that you see, non-accrual loans or anything 90 plus days is considered, it's over 90 days and, and non-accrual, which means non-accrual means it can extend for years and years and years. Um, 90 plus days is, and still accruing uh, kind of also gets lumped into that category. Now in September, excuse me, November of 2019, the numbers came in just for my asset class at $57.46 billion of distressed mortgages. That means that amount of money in distressed debt. That means that they have not, the, that amount of money, people are delinquent or not paying their mortgage, okay? Now, September and December, the numbers were almost identical. So I just lumped them into one, okay? But, but the reason they were almost identical is because between September and December of 2020, 
clearly a, almost a year after COVID started, uh, the government and the banks were putting in what's called a forbearance agreement, which means they're allowing borrowers to be delinquent and just kind of delaying or stalling uh, their payments. So, so those, those numbers are almost exactly the same. So in that same time period, so let's call it December 2020, again, just my asset class, that number jumped, distressed non-accrual debt, um, actually delinquent debt, excuse me, for, for first position non-performing uh, single family residences was $75.53 billion. Now that is a jump, everybody, in less than a year, in a year's period of time of $18 billion. So for note investors, this spells opportunity, okay? This has never been seen before, not even in 2008, everyone. This is unprecedented. There was a 23.92% increase in defaulted mortgages in just first position, single family homes, okay, of 23.92% uh, increase. That has never happened in history. It's unprecedented, okay? So that like I said, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity that is coming down the pike. It has not fully hit us yet. And the reason for that is a variety of different things. Number one, foreclosure moratoriums that were put in place. Uh, and, and most of those were still in place now that are still in place now have to do with the government backed securities, meaning FHA, VA, HUD loans, um, USDA loans, things like that. Uh, those are all, there, there has been a prolonged moratorium uh, on foreclosure in those assets. I typically buy conventional paper. So for the first three months of COVID, yes, there were foreclosure moratoriums on even my assets, but those have been lifted uh, now already, okay? The other thing that the government did is the stimulus checks. So there were stimulus checks, there was a bump in unemployment, PPP and idle loans. So the not to mention the government was printing money and is still really printing money like crazy. That's called quantitative easing. Okay, um, I'm not going to dive into that, but what that does is that has propped us up. Unfortunately, it is really devaluing our dollar, and there's horrendous consequences that are going to going to be coming down the pike and happen, in my opinion, in this marketplace. Now, we all know that real estate is cyclical, but I, between the cycle, because we were overdue for a correction anyway, and COVID and what's happening, there's tremendous opportunity for note investors to not only make a bundle of money, in my opinion, but also get to help people doing that. And I'm gonna explain that in a moment as well. So I wanted to share a couple of different uh, headlines that were going on in 2020 with you. Uh, this one says distressed debt balloons to almost a trillion dollars. Now understand that that that's all distressed debt, not just the numbers that I, not just my little asset class that I showed you. Okay, that's all distressed debt. Um, mortgage defaults could pile up at a pace that dwarf 2008. Everybody, we've already surpassed that. We've already surpassed the 2008 uh, uh, defaulted mortgages. It's already way past that. Okay. There's another thing I wanted to point out. Again, we keep looking at industry leaders. Um, if any of you have heard of a hedge fund called Oak Tree Capital, it's run by a gentleman named Howard Marks. Oak Tree Capital has $19.4 billion under management that does their real estate holdings. Oak Tree has now opened up a, and they started uh, putting together a brand new fund that's focusing on nothing but distressed mortgages, okay? And that fund, they're looking, they were looking to raise 15 billion with a B dollars, $15 billion. Now, do you think they're stupid or do you think that there's something that they know that most people don't? Well, yeah, they know something, right? They have their thumb on the pulse, uh, just like all of us note investors try to do. Uh, and, and so I watched that and I said, okay, you know, I, I'm thinking that my assessment is, is pretty dead on. And just FYI, their minimum investment for that oak for Oak Tree Capital is $10 million. So they're a pretty heavy hitter, I would say. All right. So all of that to say, 
there's a lot of FOMO that goes on, right? Fear of missing out. There's a lot of FOMO that goes on in real estate and real estate investing. I want you to know that this is a very unique time. And I do believe that the opportunities are going to present themselves and they're already starting. We're already starting to see a lot more product coming into market. We're already starting to see um, pricing going down for notes and note investors, um, which is great. Understand that not everybody is going to be in a position right now to spend the money to buy a note or several notes, et cetera. I want you to know something. The beauty part about this space is that it's never going to go away because life happens every single day to all of us. We have death. We have divorce. We have downsizing and job loss, all of which we've seen, you know, during COVID, of course, medical issues. So in this business, in my opinion, there will always be opportunity. Just because, and keep in, keep in mind something, just because a borrower has stopped paying doesn't make them a bad person. It just means life happened to them. I had life happen to me. I lost $20 million. I needed somebody to help me and work with me, right? A lot of our borrowers are in that same position. They've had death, divorce, downsizing, or medical issues. And just because they stopped paying a little while ago doesn't mean they can't start paying now. So keep that in mind. So I get the question, well, how do you make money, Paige? Well, by becoming the bank, right? That's what you do when you become a note investor. You become the bank. Understand that banks control the transaction. Banks dictate the terms and control the terms. They collect the money and they set the timetable. There's a tremendous amount of risk mitigation because being the bank really puts you in control of your invested dollars. So I love to say, of course, it's good to be the bank, right? Now, the other thing that was very important to me when I came back into real estate and real estate investing is that I didn't want a job. And I also didn't want to be beholden to one location. When I was in Arizona, I was in Arizona. I had to be there. I was away from my friends and my family. Um, so this business, I literally can do this business anywhere in the world as long as I've got a phone and a computer with internet connection. So there's a tremendous amount of freedom in that. So I've given you kind of the basics. Let's talk about some exit strategies. I'm gonna show some very basic numbers right here, everybody. Um, just so you can kind of get a feel for why another reason that I love notes and note investing. Um, and, and I'll often say that when I got into this space fully, angels sang for me because it checked all of my boxes in terms of being risk averse, right? There's certain things that I look for as an investor when I came back in and, and the notes just checks all of those boxes. All right. So Let's talk about some exit strategies. There are 23 different exit strategies in note investing, um, which again, allows you to pivot and, and mitigate a tremendous amount of risk. Um, most of the time we only use four. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. And then I'm gonna relate the numbers that I'm, I'm gonna show you right now to those four exit strategies. So there are a couple of different terms I, I, we use in note investing. Unpaid principal balance, also known as UPB, okay? So unpaid principal balance is just the principal amount of the loan that has not yet been paid, okay? So for this example and the other examples we're gonna talk about in a moment, the unpaid principal balance, the UPB, is $100,000. The legal collectible balance, also called the LCB, legal collectible balance, uh, is all is the is the unpaid principal balance plus any all and all fees, default interest, um, late fees. If we pay the property taxes on behalf of the borrower, uh, if we pay the insurance uh, on behalf of the borrower, as a lender, when you become the bank, you have the legal right to protect that asset that is securing your invested dollars. So if the borrower has stopped paying their mortgage, very likely they've stopped paying their homeowner's insurance and they've stopped paying their property taxes. Both of those things can cause a problem with that house, which is your securing collateral. So we as the bank have the, have the legal right 
to protect that house, protect that securing collateral. And it becomes the responsibility of the borrower to pay us back that money. So we can do what's called force placing the insurance, which means we put a policy in place. Oops. Everybody mute yourself, please. Thank you. I love it like everybody else loves it. Here, here's the Okay, hold on one second, everybody. Oh, thank you, Danny or whoever. All right, so so we can put an insurance place in 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 on the house. Uh, it's called force placing the insurance. And then the borrower is legally responsible to pay us back that money. They owe us that money. Same thing with property taxes, especially if we know a property is going to go to tax lien or tax deed sale um, and potentially be sold. Now we don't have any more investment because the collateral is now gone. Uh, we, can, we can pay those property taxes on behalf of the borrower and the borrower owes us that money. By the way, all of those things also collect interest at the rate that the note is set at. So if you have interest that's 9% on your note, all of those fees are also earning 9%, okay? So for this, this example, legal collectible balance is $120,000. That's the total amount of money that the borrower owes us, okay? Now, remember when I started, I said I buy based on a discounted rate of the current market value of the securing collateral, the house. Right now, and what is gonna have start happening even more and more, especially because as we all know, the market's been through the roof. The current market value of this property can go down, which is oftentimes the case when we, when we start looking at these notes. In this example, we're gonna say that the current market value of the house is $80,000 which thereby puts the, the borrower $40,000 already in the hole. So they can't even sell the property and pay off all the money that they owe me because it's only worth $80,000, okay? So I buy based on the $80,000, the current market value of the securing collateral, and I discount it from there. So for easy math, because it is kind of toward the end of the week and at the end of the evening, I buy that note based at 50%. So let's call it 50% just for easy math. So I'm going to buy that note where I'm owed 120. The house is worth 80. I'm going to buy it for $40,000. Okay. That builds in a tremendous amount of equity, everybody on the outset. And I think that pricing with this opportunity with COVID, I think the, pro the pricing is going to go, go even lower than that. And I know that because it was lower when I first started in note investing. I was paying anywhere between 36 and 46, 48% uh, uh, for my notes, okay? And I think we're gonna get there. And again, no guarantees, but just my experience and my opinion, we're gonna be going even a little bit lower, I think. So we'll see. So again, easy, easy math, I'm owed 120. I buy this note for $40,000 now, like fixing and flipping, we also have, we're fixing and flipping paper. So instead of rehab costs to fix the house, I have rehab costs to fix the paper, the note, okay? Uh, generally speaking, it's anywhere between $5,000 and $8,500 for this example. Again, easy math. We're going to use $5,000. So my all-in for this note is $45,000, okay? Automatically, I'm building in an equity cushion of a minimum of $35,000, okay? Just keep that in mind. Anything that is over $80,000 that is paid is kind of the cherry on top of the Sunday. It's gravy. It's extra. And it could happen, but it might not happen. So I always base my number on that current market value of the securing collateral. And I built in, you can see that I've built in $35,000 uh, in, in equity just on the outset, Okay. All right, so with all those numbers in mind, like I said, there are 23 different exit strategies in note investing. Um, we typically only use four. I'm gonna discuss that as soon as I take a sip of my tea. Okay, so typically we only use four. And generally speaking, I my main exit strategy, my favorite thing to do and this is how I start out buying each and every note, is with the intention to work with my borrower to get them to re-perform and stay in their home, and I get to cash flow. I get to generate not only a chunk of cash, but a stream of monthly cash flow. And I'll get there in a moment, but that's, my, that's what I try and do. It doesn't always happen. Uh, so we're gonna discuss my least favorite 
to start out, and that's foreclosure. Everybody knows what foreclosure is. Um, if the borrower stops paying on their house, then we can take the house as payment for our loan, okay? Uh, foreclosure is either a non-judicial or a judicial state. Um, the country's pretty evenly divided. Half are, are judicial, half are non-judicial, okay? Timetable, uh, anywhere between six months, um, and it could be a little bit less, but six months to now, uh, it, it, depending upon the state, it can be anywhere 16, 18 months is generally about where I, where, where I invest. There are places like New York uh, that I don't invest in notes in New York because New York is a four year minimum uh, foreclosure period. That does not work for me. I don't want my money sitting idle for four years while I'm waiting for a foreclosure. So I typically do not buy in New York unless I know that the foreclosure is already several years down the road, that it's already been started. Then I will look at New York assets, okay? But on the whole, no. Um, judicial states uh, generally are gonna be a little longer, especially now because you have to go to court to ask the court's permission uh, to foreclose on the property. So that typically takes a little bit longer period of time. Pre-COVID, uh, the states that I invest in were generally anywhere from eight to 12 months. Uh, post, well, during and post-COVID, I'm expecting that those same states are, are generally anywhere between 12 and 16 to 18 months, okay? So you can allot for that and make adjustments accordingly. Non-judicial foreclosure states, you do not have to go to court. Um, there is always, by the way, an auction. Foreclosure is always at auction. The bank gets one bid and it's the opening bid. So we get to set that opening bid. Um, and if you want the property, there are ways to set that opening bid to almost guarantee that you end up with the property. If you don't want the property, there are ways that you can set the bid that you don't, that you, it, you, you, yeah, you can make it low enough uh, that you don't end up with the property, usually. No guarantee, but usually, okay? All right, so non-judicial foreclosure states, the auction is conducted by a trustee. Uh, generally, a, a non-judicial foreclosure state takes anywhere, it, it's usually about four to five, excuse me, four to five months for the time period for noticing the public. We always have to notice the public. Um, so I like to say it generally takes about six months to get a non-judicial foreclosure uh, through from start to finish. Now, in the note space, I, I deal with return on transaction, not return on investment, largely because ROI, return on investment, uh, generally indicates a 12 month period of time. In note investing, um, oftentimes we are able to turn notes, especially non-judicial foreclosure state notes, we're able to turn those much more quickly. So you know, within six months, we've now entered into and exited out of a note, okay? So I deal with return on transaction, ROT. Now, let's say we take this note as our example, um, over to a foreclosure auction and it sells at the sale. Now, remember I said we as the bank get to control the opening bid. So we might set, if we don't want this house, we know it's worth 80, but we might set it a little bit lower to kind of promote being sold to a third party. So let's say it's a non-judicial foreclosure state and, and we're five months into this note and we end up selling this property at foreclosure auction uh, at $70,000, which means the buyer gets the property and I get a check, right? Now I didn't make my $35,000, but five months later I made $25,000 and I didn't do anything but buy the paper and take it to foreclosure auction, okay? Tremendous amount of, of, of mitigation of risk and tremendous upside in terms of profit, right? The next exit strategy is called short sale. We all pretty much know what a short sale is. And if any of you dealt back, especially back in, uh, in between 2013 and 2016-ish, give or take, if you were trying to buy a short, short sale from the bank, which means the bank's accepting less money than they are owed, uh, generally speaking, it would take you about nine to 18 months during that time frame. Because I am the bank, if my borrower comes to me and says, you know what, I don't want to, I, I, I know I owe you $120,000, but the neighbor next door really wants this house to buy for their kids, okay? 
And I know I owe you 120, but they're not going to pay 120, obviously. Uh, they are willing to, to, to pay 90,000. So a little over current market value, but less than what I owe you. Will you accept a $90,000 short payoff? How fast do you think I'm going to say yes? Really fast, right? It's not going to take me nine months. It's not even going to take me nine seconds, right? Um, so I'm looking at being able to turn this note if I can do a short sale with my borrower in typically three to six months and make a tremendous amount of, of money and help that borrower by not dinging their credit, right? And allowing them to releasing them a $30,000 worth of debt. So it creates a win-win situation. The third exit strategy I want to talk about tonight is called deed in lieu of foreclosure. Now, this is where the borrower comes to us and says, you know what, I, I don't, there are too many memories in this house. I can't afford this house. Um, and I want to, to give it to you, Mrs. Chase, as payment in full for your loan. So you don't foreclose on me. Okay. So deed in lieu of foreclosure generally will take anywhere from three to six months. Um, just because there's some paperwork that needs to be done. And also the borrowers are not always really happy to start talking with us initially because the big banks have already beat them up, right? So badly. So sometimes our loss mitigation team will reach out to them and they won't hear back for a while, okay? They won't have communication initially. So sometimes this could take a little bit longer. I'm not saying it always takes three months. I've had deed in lieu of foreclosure happen within a month of, of my buying the note, okay? But on the whole, three to six months is a pretty reasonable time frame to expect for a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Now, we could do that same thing. Uh, now that we've taken the deed to the property as payment in full, we now own the house, okay? Our loan goes away. If we don't do good due diligence, everybody, that sounds great, but sometimes there's a second position loan behind us. Sometimes there's a HELOC, a home equity line of credit it in behind us. And if we accept a deed in lieu of foreclosure without knowing if there's a, a second or a third behind us, now our loan goes away because we take the house as payment and everybody moves up a step. And we now become responsible for those loans that were behind us. So there's, there are some pitfalls. We've got to be careful. Um, but again, good due diligence. And I talk about due diligence in my workshop over and over and over again. We just really go over every nuance. But that's one little piece. So if you don't know uh, the due diligence steps to take, you could get hurt. But back to our deed in lieu of foreclosure. So let's say we now have taken possession of this property, right? We could sell it as an REO. REO stands for real estate owned. Uh, so we can sell it as an REO for $80,000. We've now hit our mark and, and created that chunk of cash, that $35,000 in profit, right? Um, or we could do a variety of other things. This is kind of where some of the other exit strategies come into play. We could fix and flip it ourselves, right? We could create, we could fix it and create a short-term rental. We could put a buy and make it a buy and hold scenario. So we can, you know, sometimes some of these houses just maybe need a little coat of paint, right? And then we can put a renter in there. So there's so many different opportunities that are available to you when you're in the bank, when you're a note investor, um, that, that you can create and control the situation. If you want the house, you don't want the house and work with the borrowers to their best possible outcome, okay? Which brings me to my favorite, right? Uh, reperforming. So a reperforming loan is when we work, my loss mitigation team works with our borrower to come to a new agreement to start paying their mortgage and start reperforming on their mortgage. Now, generally this exit strategy takes anywhere from six to 12 months. For me, it's a minimum of 12 months because I like to do what's called seasoning the note. Uh, which means I prove with the borrower that the borrower is able to pay over that course of the 12 months. Now, I never start, I ne this is also known as a loan modification, okay? A lot of banks, what they will do, and a lot of investors, what they will do is they will automatically go to a loan modification when working with a borrower. I don't do that. 
they need, they have, some of these borrowers haven't paid for years and years. So they need to have a little skin in the game, which means that they need to either come up with a small good faith deposit or a reinstatement fee. And then we're going to put a trial payment plan in place, a TPP, trial payment plan, also known as a forbearance agreement. Okay. So we're going to put a trial payment plan in place for about six months. And the borrower is going to prove that they can, in fact, make that monthly payment to me over the course of that six months. Generally, I will set the, the forbearance agreement payment, the trial payment plan payment at what we want to aim for, for the loan modification. Okay. Now, if our borrower is successful for those six months, um, then we go to a permanent loan modification. And we, as the bank, have all of the control, everybody. Now, granted, we want to create win-win situations. We want to set our borrower up to succeed, not to fail, okay? So we can do a variety of different things. We can forgive some debt, right? And we don't have to forgive all of the debt. Just because the house is only worth 80000 that doesn't mean that the borrower is not willing to do a new loan at $100,000, right? A lot of times our borrowers have families that they raised in those homes. Um, so value is really in the eye of the beholder. Um, when, we're, when we're the bank and we're creating these situations to, for success and win-win situations, just because the current market value is 80,000 doesn't mean we have to set it at that, okay? Um, I generally like to forgive some debt because it will motivate the borrower to give me a small deposit to do so. OK, we can lower interest rates. We can extend the length of the loan. Now, one thing I want to point out about the reperforming situation is during the trial payment plan, any deposits or reinstatement fees and any of those payments apply to the old loan. OK, which which means when we go to a permanent new modification, a permanent loan modification, all of that money went toward the old loan. We're starting new the day of the permanent loan modification. So basically, everybody, that's free money. It's free money to me, okay? Um, and I'm going to give you an example of that a little bit later on. Okay, so keep in mind that we have the ability to generate chunks of cash, the deposit, the reinstatement fee, and monthly cash flow in the same vehicle, okay? Now, in some of these other exit strategies, let's say we took the, the deed in lieu of foreclosure, um, we could fix it and flip, our, flip it ourselves. But what happens if we don't want to do that? We could sell it to a fix and flipper, right? We can sell it to a fix and flipper and we can carry the paper and be their bank. So we actually get, we can make a second source of income on the same house, <laughs> the same way. So we, we can be very creative and, 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 create all different scenarios that are win-win situations all the time, putting money in our pocket and not losing control. Okay. So it's, it's a lot of fun. All right. I touched on um, the workshop and how important is due diligence? Massively important. A due diligence is not only important in every real estate medium, but it's really important in this space. There are a lot of different little nuances, a lot of different little pitfalls that if you don't know and you don't educate yourself, you can get caught and you can, you can, you know, get your foot caught in the trap uh, or, and, and or lose a, a lot of money. Okay. So I like to say that good due diligence gives you virtually risk-free note investing. Uh, you do need to educate yourself. Don't just try and, and say, oh, this sounds great. I'm going to go out and buy my first note. You can do that, by the way, everybody. Right now, you can go out tonight online and buy a note. I do not suggest you do that because, again, you're not educated. You don't know all the pitfalls and you're going to get hurt, okay? Um, I also like to say there's no such thing as buying a bad note or that, excuse me, there's no such thing as a bad note, but there is such a thing as buying a note badly. Again, educate yourself. Make sure that you know the steps to take. And it, it's for every single note. It's a system. Every single note is the exact same, even though each note is different. The due diligence part of it and the system for your due diligence is exactly the same for each note. I don't have time to go over it tonight, but I did want to point that out to you that it is paramount, especially in the note space. Okay. 
All right, so um, we're gonna take a look now at some case studies. Uh, these are notes that are actually from my portfolio. Uh, this is not something, this is something, these are notes that myself and my team have worked out, okay? Um, the first one is a duplex in Casa Grande, Arizona. When we did our due diligence, uh, we discovered that this property was occupied by unknown persons. We figured they were tenants, but we weren't sure. Um, but we did know that the property was occupied in both sides of the duplex. The current market value for this particular note or this particular asset that secured our note was 120 to 125 thousand um, dollars. Again, I buy based on the current market value of the securing collateral. So all in for this non-performing note, that's what NPN is, was sixty four thousand uh, dollars, sixty four five. We acquired this note in late 2018. Again, the property was occupied by unknown persons. We ended up foreclosing on this note and it did come back to us as REO, as real estate owned, okay? And that actually surprised me because I priced it pretty well. Um, I priced it a little low, lower than current market value, but I was expecting it to sell and it did not. And the cool thing is, is that it actually did us a little bit of a favor. I'll explain that in a moment. Now, now we owned the duplex, okay? So our loss mitigation team, who was the one that liaises between the borrowers and ourselves. by the way, I don't ever talk to my borrowers, my loss mitigation team does, and then I manage my managers. So note investing is very front end loaded in terms of your time. You spend the bulk of your time doing your due diligence before you buy the note. And once you buy it, you hand it off to your teams, which is really cool, frees up a lot of time, okay? So our loss mitigation team uh, recommended that we evict these people. And I thought, you know, I don't want to do that. I re let's let's send a door knocker out there and let's see what's going on. Sure enough, these two families had been had been there. One had been there seven years. The other had been there for five years. Um, they were paying rent to a property manager. So our door knocker asked for the property manager's name and telephone number, which we did get. Okay, we contacted the property manager, and sure enough, there was some rent that was sitting in her trust account, ready to be deployed and it came to us because we now owned that duplex. So we, we created a chunk of, of cash. We had a little cash flow there, right? Um, and then we wanted, we told the property manager, you know, we want to sell this asset so we can recapture our capital. Did she know of anybody, any, any investor that was looking for an investment property, a buy and hold property that was already fully loaded, meaning that there were already tenants in the property? She said, yes, I do. Sure enough, uh, 21 days later, we sold that property for cash as is, fully loaded for $120,000. We paid uh, that property manager a small, you know, regular commission. She earned 3%. Um, and we, after closing costs, we had a net profit of $54,500, which is approximately a 54% return on transaction. Now, again, this was Arizona, non-judicial. This happened in less than a year. Our JV's partners portion was 27%, okay? So they were pretty happy. The next one, and bear with me, I know we're running a little, little late. I, I'm almost done. So we have just two more case studies and then a couple other little announcements and then questions. So hang in with me, everybody. Um, this next one is, is a property that was securing a note. It was in Richmond, Virginia, and it's a gorgeous old Victorian. Now, my sweet spot, everybody, my passion, I love gorgeous old Victorian homes. I just do. Don't fall in love with the homes, but I'm, I'm a, what I call a, a reformed rehabber. So this one really kind of took, took hold of my heart. Um, now, some squatters had done some minor damage in this. There was a small fire in, in the house. Uh, the current market value of this property was $125,000 as it sat. Um, and I, because I'm a reformed rehabber, I wanted to find out what the ARV was. And the ARV I calculated at about 225. ARV stands for after repair value. Okay. Okay. So all in for this non-performing note was $54,200. Our borrower was deceased. Uh, the heirs did not want anything to do with the property, but they were not willing to give us a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Um, I kind of really did look at this property about fixing and flipping it myself, okay? I chose not to do that. 
Uh, so we took a look at the area. Now understand that this, that in our due diligence, we had discovered that this area at one point had been a little sketchy, a little rough in the past, okay? But it was in the process of gentrification. As a matter of fact, across the street was a brand new rehab. It was almost done. It hadn't been completed, but it was almost done. Now this property and next door to this property, um, it was zoned R3. There, was a, there were apartment buildings down the street um, and multifamily units uh, right next door and down the street. So somebody could have bought this property, torn it down and put up an apartment complex because it was zoned R3, okay? And it was a pretty sizable lot, by the way. Um, keep in mind that the squatters had done some minor damage. There was a fire in one little area. Now we took this to foreclosure auction, okay? The total unpaid principal balance, remember UPB, was $160,000 and change. Our legal collectible balance was $217,000, okay? Now keep in mind, the current market value as it sat was only 125. So we probably were not gonna see anything much over 125. Now, understanding that we were owed a lot more and that this house was probably gonna be pretty highly sought after, we decided to start the opening bid for the auction, the foreclosure auction, a little higher because we would not have minded if we had to rehab this house, okay? But we also wanted it low enough that we maybe could create a bidding war. And that's exactly what happened. We started this, the auction, our opening bid was $116,828. And by the way, I don't ever use round numbers. Um, it's a psychological thing. So it's always, you'll see it end in a two or an eight or a seven or a nine. It's never a round number. So 116,828. We did have a bidding war. We sold this property at foreclosure auction for $124,211. Our net profit in less than a year was 70,000 and change, um, which is approximately 129% return on transaction. I more than doubled my money on this one. We had a JV partner, he, his portion was 65% and he was absolutely ecstatic, right? In less than a month. Now because I'm a reformed rehabber, right? I kept up with this property. This upper picture is the picture that our realtor took, uh, the boots on the ground, our realtor took this picture. The lower picture is a screenshot that I took from Zillow a few months later, okay? So the person that bought it at auction did do some rehab. It didn't require a lot. It had been updated, but it needed rehab. Um, they rehabbed the house and turned around and sold that property for $230,000, okay? Imagine if you are a fix and flipper, how note investing can work to your benefit, right? Imagine if that was you fixing and flipping just by buying the note, right? We could have taken this to auction and, and set that opening bid if we really wanted the house, we could have set that opening bid at $217,000 because that's how much money we were owed and we would not have gotten it. So we would have gotten the house back. I wanted the check, however. So I set it a little bit, a little bit lower in the hope of creating that bidding war, okay? Last one, everybody, my favorite exit strategy. This one is an owner-occupied single-family residence in Richmond, Kentucky. Uh, this property, the owners had stopped paying as of April of 2012. Okay, so many years, many, many years. We bought this note in September of 2018. All in for this non-performing note was $49,252. Again, we bought it in September, 2018. Our owner had, by our due diligence, our, we discovered our owner had been there since 1998. Now, knowing that I try and work with my borrowers and get them to re-perform, I had a pretty good idea that this borrower is gonna wanna stay right? So I knew that because they had been there for so long. Our legal collectible balance on this note was 95000 and change. The interest rate they were paying was so high, 10.99%. The husband had a medical condition, which is why they stopped paying. And he was down for three years. He could not work for three years. Um, and so it, it caused a problem. But now a lot of time had passed. And so he had you know, in the six years that they had not been paying, they were now able to pay. Sure enough, our borrowers were contacted by our loss mitigation team and they wanted to stay in their home. 
Um, in March of 2019, so a few months later, we put a TPP, the trial payment plan, we put that in place for six months. We, we gave them a couple different options. They chose option B, which was a $1,000 reinstatement fee, uh, which created a small chunk of cash for us, right? Um, they were successful in their TPP payments. So they paid six months of their monthly mortgage, their, what would be their new monthly mortgage payment, plus $100 a month. And the reason for that is because our loss mitigation team charges a success fee which we pass along to the borrower and they pay that over the trial payment plan. So they paid for six months, $708 a month, 708.40 actually, um, which created $4,248 in cash flow for us. Okay, now again, keep this in mind, the $1,000 and the 42.48 did not apply to the new loan, it applied to the old loan, right? So they were successful, we modified the loan as of October 1st of 2019. Uh, what we did is we rolled some of that arrearage into a brand new uh, unpaid principal balance. So we created a new UPB of $87,500. We dropped their interest rate to 8%, okay? And then we extended their loan. So we started their loan over and we made it a 40 year loan, which makes the payments more manageable but we gave it 40 years, okay? Um, and, and we started that, that's a refi, everybody. A loan modification is basically a refi if you do it this way. Now, what happens in when you start a new loan? Most of the principal and interest payment is interest. That's pure profit to us, everybody. The interest in a reperforming loan is our profit, okay? So let's add all this stuff up. $1,000 deposit, $4,248 plus $608.40 a month for 12 months, right? Because that's their new payment. All of that stuff uh, added together, we were expecting the first year cash on cash return uh, for 20 as 25.5%, okay? And if we look at the amortization schedule, that $87,500 at 8% for 480 months, of that $608.40 payment, P&I payment, principal and interest payment, $580 of it is interest. That's the average for 24 months, right? That's pure profit to us, everybody. We created a win-win situation. The borrower gets to keep their home. We get to create chunks of cash and streams of monthly cash flow, and we don't have the headache of the tenants in the toilets. Because when the toilet breaks, our borrower doesn't call us. We're the bank, not a landlord, okay? So it fits all of the little boxes that I like to check, right? I can, I can do this business anywhere. I get to create chunks of cash and streams of monthly cash flow. I get to help people stay in their homes. Um, if we have vacant properties, then I have a variety of different things that I can do in terms of exit strategy. Uh, you know, either taking that property back or selling it to a fix and flipper. So for me, that's why note investing and uh, became so important and, and dominant in my life. And I literally switched my whole portfolio over uh, to note investing because it just angel sang for me. And I'm hope I'm hoping you're hearing a little bit of their singing as well. Okay, so you've heard me mention, you've heard me say that I do teach a workshop. I want you to know I am an active note investor. I only do this two times a year. That's it. Um, I do not have time for any others uh, uh, to, to do more. I used to do three. I'm too busy. And with what's coming because of, of the coronavirus, um, all of that stuff, it, it's, I'm just too busy. So two times a year. The next one's coming up next month, May 14th through 16th. It is virtual, it's via Zoom, okay? It is live, but it's via Zoom. Uh, it's limited, again, I only do two per year. I limit this to 50 people, that's it, because there's a lot of uh, material to cover and there are a lot of questions. I wanna make sure that all of your questions are answered. I wanna get to know you. I want you to be able to network with your other people in the, in the workshop. So I limit it to 50 people, okay? Uh, again, it's live, but it's virtual. So we will be doing it via Zoom. It's all three days, full days, everybody. Normally it's 697 because you are attending tonight. It is $597. Okay, so there's $100 off 
uh, to get that hundred dollars off, go to cashflowchick.com forward slash simply do it uh, to register your spot. Um, I am about two thirds full already. Okay. So just so you know, um, I I've already, I'm pretty full, uh, for the workshop about two thirds of the way there. If you're not quite sure, and you just want some more information and you want some free stuff, here's where you go to get that. Go to cashflowchick.com forward slash free and cashflowchick.com forward slash info. I will send you podcasts and videos and webinars and books and all kinds of stuff for free. Uh, if you go there. Um, and if you think, you know what, that's a great page, but I, I really just want to be, take the more passive route. I would love to talk to you. Uh, go to cashflowchick.com forward slash invest for information, or you can schedule a calendar, go directly on my calendar, schedule a call with me. I'd love to talk with you about any options you may have. Uh, go to meetme.so forward slash cashflowchick and book a consultation with me directly on my calendar at a time that's convenient for you. Um, if you, uh, here's my contact information. So info at cashflow check and then all the social media, of course, you know, I'm, I'm on just about everything. Instagram is at the cashflow check. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed the presentation. I've had a lot of fun being here. Let's, uh, let's take some questions. I think I see, I saw some, some chat messages going up here. Okay. Danny, are you there? Let me. I'm right here. I was just uh, <laughs> staying in the dark, uh, not to disturb your uh, disturb you. But I'm here. I, I definitely saw one question. Uh, what are you? Um, what are you fixing? What is? It, what needs to be fixing? Terrific question. Okay, so know. yes, what am I fixing on a note? Okay, so again, these uh, these borrowers that are have stopped paying, um, they're De they're delinquent, they're, they're, they're in default and they need help. So I do need to um, work with them hand in hand to get them to re-perform or to get them out of a bad situation if they want to leave. And there are costs that are associated with that. So when I say fixing the note, that means getting them to a position where they either want to re-perform like my last case study uh, and get them to, to be able to stay in their home and create a win-win situation and set them up for success or uh, get them out of the home and, and you know, we take over the house and start to, to figure out which exit strategies are best. Now there are associated costs with that. Remember what I said, I, I employ a loss mitigation team. There's a monthly charge for that. So that's part of our workout costs. That's part of fixing this note. Um, the, if I put the insurance, the force place insurance in place, that's part of fixing this note. That's considered a workout cost, right? Um, property taxes, delinquent property taxes. Uh, property preservation is another one. Let's say they've already vacated the home and there's a broken window. We legally can board that window up and charge that to the borrower. So all of those are kind of costs that are incorporated uh, in, in my workout. And so I call them, that's what I call them, uh, why I call them workout costs, because they're, they're part of getting this note back to performing in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can go back to the previous slide. There we go. Karen, there we go. All right, I'll read the next one. How, yeah. do, you protect, how do you protect yourself from the inflation? Inflation, okay. So inflation obviously you know, takes a hold and, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. But keep in mind that again, when I buy this note, I'm automatically building in $35,000 worth of equity. So if inflation goes up, if prices come down, if current market value comes down, let's say it drops, let's say it drops 50%. Now, historically, not even in 2008, has, uh, has our real estate market ever dropped 50% in six months? It's dropped that much, but it's happened over a long period of time. But let's say it did. Let's say it just blew out history and it dropped 50%. So now it dropped to $40,000, uh, $40, which is where we started, right? That's our purchase price. So we might be a little bit behind the eight ball because we've got We've got 5,000 into it for workout costs, but 
that that's certainly very manageable. Again, we can pivot also and, and do a variety of different things to hedge against that. If, if inflation hits and, and let's say the market completely bottoms out, we could put a tenant in there, right? And, and cash flow it for years to hedge against, against that inflation because there's no loan on it. So that's also pure profit. Or we could put a loan in place. We could refinance. If we own the house, we can refinance the house for a very low interest rate, right? Um, and, and, and leave some equity there, recapture our capital, and then put a tenant in there. In, and that will hedge against inflation too. So there's so many different things that you can do, especially because we're buying at such a big discount. When you buy in that big a, with that big a discount, it mitigates a tremendous amount of the risk, including inflation. Um, well, before I, get, I take the, the next one, um, we have someone who's asking if you can switch back to the discount uh, yes. slide. And then uh, while you're doing this, um, next question is, as a note investor, uh, and when, I guess, when using the reperforming exit strategy, do, do we report these uh, faithful payments to the credit bureau? Such a good question. Um, I don't, I do not report to the credit bureau. My servicing company does. So yes, um, servicing is part of my team and uh, the servicers that I use and not all of them do this. You have to ask, um, but my servicers do report to the credit bureaus to help that borrower to start reestablishing their credit. So yes, the answer is yes, but I personally don't do it which is another beautiful thing is that my team handles all that day-to-day -day stuff and I just manage my team. Uh, Paige, when you say my, uh, the, you know, the, 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 it seems like there's other servicers or, or providers or team, um, do you mean you've set up your own, like loss mitigation, you mentioned loss mitigation a few times. Yep. Does, is, are those your team, like your employees or someone you uh, directly work for you or there's a servicer company and there's a loss mitigation company yep. like, uh, uh, like specialists in their field and you're just tapping into them um, in order to provide that kind of a service or interaction with a, with a Bauer, I guess. That's such a good question. Okay. Now, as a note investor, it is not against the law to talk to your borrower. However, there are certain... CFPB rules and regulations that you should be aware of. And there are certain Dodd-Frank provisions that you should be aware of in note investing. So my servicers and my loss mitigation, and sometimes servicers are also handle loss mitigation, okay? I choose to keep them separate, but they are licensed debt collectors mm -hmm. in the states where I buy my assets, my notes. Um, so. They are licensed debt collectors. They know all the rules and regulations. They know what to say. So they are third party. They are not my employees. They are third party providers that I pay a monthly, their monthly fee. Um, and it's nominal for what they do. They handle all the communication contact with the borrower. They liaise between if you have to go to a foreclosure, let's say you're doing running a foreclosure in Ohio, right? Um, my loss mitigation team liaises between the Ohio foreclosure attorney and me. So I don't even have to deal with that. They handle everything. I manage them. That's it. But they're third party licensed debt collectors um, that I hire outside of my organization. Good, good. Um, how do you equip yourself from a legal perspective? What is the most challenging part of this type of investing? What is the minimum ideal minim, uh, minimum investment investing to start with a node investing? So I think we get this like three part question. Yeah, three part question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so legal, um, challenging, the, cha the biggest challenge and kind of maybe a rule of thumb, uh, you know, amount needed. Yeah. Okay. So the first two is kind of, is, is kind of one and the same. Number one, um, it, it literally, education, 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 education. You need, I don't care if you don't use me, but please educate yourself and surround yourself with people that do know. So from a legal perspective, again, rely heavily on your loss mitigation and your servicing teams, because again, they're licensed 
Um, debt collectors, they know all the legalese. They know what you can and cannot say. Um, so they will protect you. In terms of the challenge, the biggest challenge is education. Um, and the big, that's the biggest challenge, hands out, because no two notes are the same, but I'll tell you the, the steps to go into investing, that is exactly the same. So the systems are really important. Um, I would say that that is probably a big challenge for, for note investors, not knowing what the potential risks are and what due diligence steps you need to take. That's the challenge. Um, after that, once you know that, once you've got your teams, and by the way, everybody in my workshop, I give you my team. So my, my loss mitigation team actually comes and speaks. You actually get to meet them. Uh, so, so I also give you my team. Kind of gives you a heads up or a head start, so to speak. Um, in terms of the minimum ideal investment, everybody is different. Um, at the workshop, you'll hear me say very often, it depends because it does. It depends on who you are as an investor. It depends on how much capital you have to deploy. It depends on what your sweet spot is. Are you in a position where you can take a little more risk or, or you wanna take a little less risk? Um, you know, there's a variety of different notes that are available that might be in some sketchier areas, but they're gonna be a lot cheaper. Right, so if you're okay with that, fine. Um, I've had notes come to me for free. I've had notes that I've bought that have been thirty-five hundred dollars. I've had notes that have been, that I've bought. My sweet spot, generally, I don't like to spend more than about one hundred and fifty thousand on any one given note, um, just because I like to be able to put that money in different buckets. But but I've I've spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a note. You can spend millions on a note. Just depends. Um, so there's, it, it really depends on who you are as an investor and what your risk tolerances are. Um, generally speaking, uh, anywhere, I, I hate to say that because it's not necessarily true and we're going into unique times. I, I think you should just kind of keep that assessment for yourself. Most people land somewhere between uh, 20, 25,000 for a note. They like to kind of hover in that area up to you know about 50,000, generally speaking. But, but again, you can buy notes for much cheaper. You don't have to spend that much. Just depends on who you are as an investor. Okay. Um, Paige, before I'll, I suggest we take two more questions, but before yep. that, just uh, maybe uh, if you can help, uh, if I wanna see or anyone who wants to see the content, uh, the, the breakdown of what those three days, you know, the schedule, the, uh, where can we see that? Um, generally, what will happen is, is if you go to the registration link, there's an agenda. There's a little spot on the registration page that says see uh, sample agenda. Okay. So if you click that, it'll give you exactly okay. what, what the agenda is. Okay. Um, good. The next question is where and how do you get your leads? I'm, I'm assuming the you know, Goss is referring to notes, uh, probably. Yes. Uh, I assume so. Yes. Okay. So again, I, I have, i create relationships with asset managers and asset managers, everybody, that's my term for all of them. That might be the per, the seller, whoever's in charge of selling the, the non-performing notes from small regional banks. Uh, I can't go into Wells Fargo. I'm not big enough to buy from Wells Fargo, everybody. So I don't. Okay. But smaller regional banks, um, uh, hedge funds, uh, other note investors, note brokers, there's all different kinds of, of people selling notes. And so I call them all asset managers. I develop relationships. I, I reach out through LinkedIn. I go to note conferences, I, I, things like that. Bigger Pockets is another one. Um, so I just develop relationships. I start talking with them and they literally, when they have things to sell, they, it literally shows up in my inbox. I don't even really have to ask for it. I develop the relationship. They put me on their list. When they've got stuff to sell, they send it to my inbox. Now, I do keep in touch with them because I, I like to stay in front of their face, right? Um, so every couple of months, I'll send them an email. Hey, how are you doing? Or, you know, send, depending upon the asset manager, might send in a text them, you know, hey, how are you doing? Do you have anything to sell? Um, is there anything I can help you with, et cetera, et cetera. So I just, that's how I get my leads. Okay, perfect. Last question. If buying notes from your self-directed account, how much do you keep or should keep in your account as a backup since you cannot add money into those accounts that, that easily? 
Um, Self-directed, again, I am not a custodian, so definitely talk with your custodian about how much you can add or can't add. Um, that's not my forte, but uh, this is, I do have a lot of investors that I work with that have self-directed IRAs, and that's the vehicle that they use to invest in, in notes with me. Um, it's the perfect vehicle to do that. I typically like to hold a little bit back just to have um, just a cushion. You know, I like to in anything because there's always contingencies, right? So I like to have a reserve account and, and like if you were going to rehab a house, um, generally you're going to build in a 10 to a 15% contingency. And that's about what I do per note when I, when I set aside funds in a reserve. By the way, I think the last question is important. Uh, um, part of the training will be sharing access to those uh, asset managers, so to speak. Yes. So um, part of the training is I do start you out and I give you some sources uh, for notes and buying notes. Um, again, I, I'm not going to give you all of them. <laughs> I've worked very hard to build my list. And not all of you are going to be at the same position where I am. You know, I'm in a position where I can buy pools of notes and you might not be. And so sometimes asset managers, um, some of them only have pools to sell, right? Some you can cherry pick or pick, you know, buy one at a time. Uh, so there's different asset managers for different levels. Um, but I do give you some asset managers to start out and, and, and where to go from there and where to find them. So you're, I'm going to teach you how to find notes, how to fund notes and what to do with them once you buy them. Paige, um, I'm going to say before I, I want to say thank you. Um, I was planning on participating in this event um, myself personally. Um, yeah. unfortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, I have a family, I mean, ported family visit surprise uh, from uh, another country, which is after almost two years. Oh so my goodness, exactly. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'll have to uh, either join after or the next one, or is there a, or I can, uh, or, or is it going to be recorded so I can just uh, watch the recording? Um, I do, because everybody's on this video um, and on this webinar, I will send out the recording, um, but I don't think there's, there's certain things that you're going to see um, because I actually, we actually do do go through a tape. We go through collateral files and we go through a variety of different things that are confidential. So there's waivers that need to be signed. Gotcha. Um, and so if, if you're registered, then you'll get the recording. Right. That's um, what I mean. If I, yeah. if I still want to yeah. uh, you know, join, but I can't this specific dates on the live, I'll be able to access it all in the recording afterwards. Yep. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And it does take about a month for my, for my editor to come back because you know, we, as you know, it's all just a big right. bulk and, and to be edited down to manageable, but, but it takes about a month, but I do send those out for free. So anybody registering, by the way, don't check that little box that says 197 for the recordings because I'm going to give them, I'm going to throw them in. I'm going to give them to you for free. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Always tons of information, detailed, um, you know, it's, it's so, so much pleasure to, to, to speak to someone with a vast knowledge, experience, a doer, not just a talker, a doer, uh, a walker. So that's really, really appreciated. More questions are coming in. Naturally, <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm intrigued, like to maybe another one and another one, but I think we also have to be respectful for your time, for the Thank participants' you. time, and maybe live a little bit to the, uh, to the workshop too. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I promise a fire hose of information for the workshop and, and, and I mean it, uh, I make that promise and you, I don't hold anything back. Um, Danny, as you know, uh, yep. I, I'm the type of person that if I'm going to teach somebody how to fish, I'm going to give them all of the tools. <laughs> I'm not going to hold anything sure. back. I don't, you know, that I, yeah. that bothers me when people do that and I'm I just agree. not that way. So yes, you will have all kinds of information um, thrown at you and, and given to you and there is a workbook. So you're going to write it down. Plus you get the recordings as well. So perfect. Yeah. Very good. All right, everyone. Thank you for those who stayed so you know, uh, up until now. And I know a few already started dropping out. So yep. I really appreciate, Paige, I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Uh, we'll, see you the we'll see you virtually in the workshop. Uh, have a terrific rest of your uh, night and terrific weekend coming up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Paige.
Thank you.